Welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, the risk of repeating the intro slightly. I'm Adam, I work for New Relic. One of the languages I work on support for at New Relic is in fact Go, um, which means that I still don't really know what I'm talking about, but my job title says theoretically I do. So, what is going on with Go dependency management? Well, before I can actually like just show you how awesome it is now, or at least, you know, functional it is now, which is a vast improvement on a year ago. Um, I have to go through some history. Um, five years from now, when new gophers are picking up the language, um, you won't really need to know mu as much of this, but understanding how Go's package management works today really requires understanding how we got to the point where Go's package management works the way it does today. So, when Go was first shipped, um, packet dependency management in Go was basically this tool called GoGet, which is still in the, the standard Go tool. And it's dependency management by not having dependency management. Um, basically what it does is if you run it, it goes out to GitHub and it downloads the current, clones the current master of whatever package you told it to go clone. Um, there is interestingly no concept of versioning in this or dependencies or really anything. Um, so basically you go get it, it would go into your Go path, and for those of you who are not as familiar with Go, Go kind of has this concept of a Go path, and the idea is that you have one workspace for all of your projects. Um, some people really love this, uh, it personally makes my eye twitch really badly, um, but you know, it, different strokes, different folks. Now, there were some hacks, there was this thing called gopackage.in, which basically did like URL fronting, so you could say, hey, get me this specific version of something. Um, but these weren't generally terribly useful because libraries had to set up their import paths internally to use the same URL. So it would have to be gopackage.in something, 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 version number. So it was kind of like an interesting attempt to work around the problem, but it just didn't really work in practice. And unfortunately, I know this because we tried to use a new relic and like before we even shipped the Go agent, we were just like, no. Like there were so many problems with that. But it was a nice idea. So the situation in that zeroth generation wasn't really tenable. So fairly obviously, this was about, I don't know, 2013, 2014. A lot of other languages already had package managers at that point or dependency managers. So a whole bunch of tools sprung up like weeds to implement package and vendor management to certain degrees. Um, some of them had ambitions of becoming the standard package manager. Uh, for example, this is from a tool called Glide. Um, and basically Glide explicitly called out like it was trying to clone Cargo, NPM, Composer, you know, basically Gem, you know, whatever package ma dependency manager you want to think of for whatever language uh, you like as direct inspiration. So it kind of had like that two-step like you set up your dependencies and then you install them and then you build kind of setup. Um, the Go team did take some note of this. Um, Go 1.5 shipped with what they called the vendor experiment which in 2015, which then became official about six months later in the following release. Um, and that allowed you or you know, your tool like Glide to set up directories that were called vendor within your source directories. And they had special import resolution rules and that made things a little bit better. You know, it kind of opened the door that theoretically tooling could actually put stuff in the right places and manage it for you. But, there were a couple of issues. Um, one was GoPath itself. Um, the name resolution rules had to be fairly complicated because vendor directories had to bind very closely to the packages they were in, which meant that you got some occasionally really entertainingly difficult to debug uh, resolution issues where you would think you were pulling in one version of something or one, one clone of something and you'd be pulling in a different one because it would have jumped somewhere or it wasn't binding as tightly as it should have. The other problem was there were just too many alternatives. It was kind of like, um, I don't know how many people were writing Python 10 years ago, but it was kind of like when before pip sort of became the standard package manager where you had like easy install, you had pip, you had a whole bunch of other stuff I've long since repressed through alcohol. Um, and they all had their own metadata formats, they all had their own tagging expectations, they all had their own source code layout expectations. So if you're using say Glide, but the person you want to pull in a package and the person only had, say, GoDep, which was another tool, or GoVendor as the thing they were using to manage their dependencies, was you're kind of getting into really tricky interop things. 
Now, while all this was going on, every year Go, like a lot of newer languages, does a developer survey. Um, and one of the questions is, what is the biggest challenge you personally face using Go today? And it's a free-form text field. They do no grouping. It is actually fairly useless. But the, the thing that was always really telling, in, and this was from 2016, is that like, if you read those, like, almost all of those involved, could probably involve dependency management or package management. The only one that really obviously isn't is generics and IDE. And even IDE, depending on how, what IDE you're using, could theoretically still touch on that. So the grouping's kind of poor, like the highest percentage is 6.9%, but if you actually go through and like add up all of the percentages for anything that looks like package management or dependency management, it was like half of the responses. Um, so you get the general idea. So a guy called Sam Boyer went off and did a whole bunch of research and came up with a design for a tool that he called DEP. And it was developed with the explicit intention of being the official dependency management tool for Go, shipped with the standard tooling. Um, it also has what I would consider to be one of the cutest logos um, I think I've seen in quite a while. I, I really like that one. So it integrated with existing features because it was trying to be an official track thing and Sam had engaged with the core team very early on. Um, it, it relied on GoPath, so it still had that like single workspace idea so it didn't disrupt people's workflows. Um, but it kind of looked recognizable if you were coming from a different language. Like it still had that separate install and update step. It, dependency resolution used the same you know, SAT solver approach uh, that everybody else basically uses. And it was more or less recognizable. You'll note that I've just used the past tense quite carefully um, in that entire section, because that all sounds great. Um, but before DEP became the standard tool, something else happened. Okay, so now we're in 2018, which is apparently now the dim distant past, because it's you know, a year ago. Um, the 2017 developer survey was run at the end of 2017. And for the first time, because DEP existed, the biggest actual word that meant anything was generics instead of package management. Um, good for generics. Generics have been coming second for a long time. Um, I think it was time for generics to get its day in the sun. So dependency management wasn't the top pain point all of a sudden. Then, Russ Cox, who was also on the Go uh, core team, had been increasingly and vocally dissatisfied with the direction of DEP and instead proposed a tool that he was calling VGO for version Go in a series of uh, really academic essays that I once tried to read and fell asleep. Um, but there's some, there's some good stuff in there. Basically, his idea was much more radical. Um, firstly, it got rid of, so DEP, like a lot of package managers, um, is really slow at figuring out dependencies because it turns out that doing um, dependency management the traditional way is an NP-complete problem. Um, for those of you like myself who have a, an extremely mediocre computer science background, that just means it's really slow, um, mathematically really slow. So you'll notice this in practice. If you, I guess if you think about like how long it takes um, NPM to run NPM install um, when you are first setting up a new package and it doesn't have a lock file, it's pretty slow. Um, Composer in the PHP world used to take minutes for complicated uh, dependency resolution. So Vigo tried to sidestep, tries to sidestep that idea by not even bothering to try and solve the graphs, but it implements a different algorithm that Russ called minimal version selection. And this is one of the like 10 diagrams in one of the PDFs, and I'm not gonna try and explain it because I don't actually understand it. But the basic point is that you get a stand, you get the same set of versions deterministically out of the, uh, the module file, out of the dependencies, regardless of if there are newer versions that have been released that would still be compatible. And he called it minimal version selection because it was like a minimal algorithm, but it also is minimal in the sense that it usually picks the minimal version, the oldest version, if possible, in your requirements instead of the newest. This has pros and cons. The other thing about Vigo which was interesting was it got rid of the idea of go path for almost everyone. So it still exists, but basically if you have a go.mod file in your file system, that is considered to be the root of the go path, no matter what you actually set the go path to. So you can now have one workspace per project. This alone actually made me think this was a good idea. So with some refinement, Vigo was uh, quickly and controversially and involved a whole bunch of drama that I'm not even touching on, um, adopted by the Go team, and it shipped as a nominally experimental feature in Go 1.11, which is the current stable version back in August. Um, 
it got renamed to go mod um, instead of vgo, which is probably good. It fits in more with the command syntax. Um, and in go 1.12, which I think is coming out next month or maybe in March, um, it will become the officially blessed solution. So it's a good time to get on board. So I'm going to talk about the practicalities of using GoMod, and then I am going to tempt the live demo gods by actually trying to use it. So as I said, the key basically is you have the single go.mod file at the root of your project. This is basically equivalent to a package.json if you know NPM or a gem file or something like that. It contains the canonical import path for your project, so what other people would use, like say github.com slash something slash project name, and it includes its dependencies. So generally speaking, it, you create, generally speaking, you create it using a tool called GoMod in it, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, it's just a text format, it's human readable and writable, it uses its own special syntax because of course it does, um, but it's not terribly hard to understand. It kind of looks like a Go import block if you turn your head and squint a bunch. Another way in which Go mod differs is it doesn't have a lock file. So as I said, M minimal version selection basically says that unless developers do shenanigans like say retagging a release that you depend on, you should get the exact same code every time. Um, to ensure that, it has this thing called go.sum, and it's just cryptographic checksums for the code that you've pulled in. So it's not a lock file in the sense it describes what comes in, but you still want to check it in alongside because it basically prevents tampering down the track. The final thing that you need to know is that if you're going to use go mod, and I strongly recommend it, um, you are absolutely opting into semantic versioning. Um, go mod makes a whole bunch of assumptions that everything is going to be semantically versioned. So if you make a breaking change, you've got to go from version one to version two to version three. Um, but in the Go ecosystem, that's not a huge problem. It's a new enough ecosystem that kind of everybody thought Semver was a good idea by the time Go came out. Um, but, you know, it's something to be aware of, particularly if you're writing a library. All right, so let's look at a few examples of it in use. Now, I can only sort of half see my screen here, so we're just going to see what happens. Okay. So firstly, let's just look at a brand new project. So I just have nothing in here right now. This, it's an empty project. I'm gonna write some Go files, but I just wanna set up my Go, my Go mod so that I have a Go path. So I can just run Go mod in it. Cannot deter module path, because I don't have one. No import comments. Huh, I swear this worked. But you can also just tell it that you want a particular path. So, and there you go. And that creates a go.mod, which you can see there. And it's just a single module line that just says, hey, this is how people would import it. Okay, that wasn't very interesting. Let's say you have an existing project. Now, this is actually a project, a real project that I have from a side project I was working on a couple of years ago. And you can see it's got kind of Glide metadata in there. So I was using Glide as the dependency manager until I realized Glide was hopelessly broken. Um, and then I actually rewrote this in Python. Um, but it's still a good example. Um, I can run Go mod in it, and Go mod in it can parse about 10 different types of metadata. So it, can, it parses Dep, it parses Glide, it parses a whole bunch of things. When it works, it's kind of magic. Let's see if it works. Okay, so it's creating a new Go.mod. Um, it picked up the module name. It's copying the requirements from the glide.lock, which was the lock file that glide created. And theoretically, I now have a go.mod file, and I do. So you can see here that this project, this is a GPS receiver project, so it pulls in this library to do like data parsing, it pulls in this internal library for stuff, it pulls in protobuf, because stuff goes down in protobuf, it pulls in the serial library, and it pulls in Redis, because we're talking to Redis. So basically, it was able to go in it Go mod in it was able to parse the glide.lock file I had and basically pull out those dependencies and set up a thing. And theoretically now, I could just go ahead and build this. Let's see if that works. So you can see there, because those packages didn't already exist, it goes out, it finds them, it clones them, it downloads them. It did a build, so this was just using standard go, to, go build, no special command there. And I should now have a thing. And I do. 
So basically, like in two commands, go mod in it and go build, I went from something I wrote in about the go 1.6 days uh, using Glide to something that now works with the current version of Go. Okay. If you have a new build, if you have a new clone, if it's got the go mod and go some files in there, then it's the same thing. You literally just run go build and it builds. Okay, and the final one is what happens if I want to upgrade a dependency? And I'm gonna cheat a little bit on this one just because I, the syntax is just long enough that I will forget the exact URL. So in the go mod file that was created, this is the, this is the same one, you can see here that we depend on uh, version 4.2.3 of the Redis library. Now, since then, there's like version 5 and version 6, but I don't want to, you know, rewrite my code. There is actually a newer version 4 version as well. There's a 4.2.4. So let's say that I want to grab that. So here's a shell script I wrote earlier to cheat, and basically here's the syntax. So basically, you still use go get, so there's no special go mod command, it still uses go get, dash u means update, which has been the case for every version of go since the beginning. There's the same URL, so it's on gopackage.in, redis.v4, but then you can put an at in, and then you put in the exact version number that you want. And if I run that, it goes and finds it, it grabs it, it should have updated the go.mod file for us. It did, excellent. And I should now be able to build it with redis424. So that worked. So basically, that is, in a nutshell, Go mod. So the interesting part is kind of the integration. You don't, if you're used to using Go get and Go build and Go install, it basically works the exact same way. There's just a little bit of magic if you have the go.mod file where it does all the resolution for you and it just figures, and basically that is now the root of your Go path. And you can treat it like a normal language project in most other languages instead of having this whole Go path workspace concept. If you really like the Go path workspace concept, there is a way to still use it that way. I just don't remember off the top of my head what the environment variable is to switch that back on. I would recommend switching to this because, you know, there's a reason why almost every other language has multiple workspaces per project. It's just easier to reason about. So, with that, I thank you very much for coming. And I think I have like two minutes if anyone has any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Okay, get some exercise. Excellent. <laughs> Make Chris work. Uh, somebody on that side should ask next. Hey, so uh, in the uh, uh, version update uh, slide, you demonstrated how to update version uh, when you use go package in, which actually supports URL uh, right. version update. Uh, how do, can you do it? How do you do it if a uh, version is a tag in a Git, whatever? It's the exact same syntax, and I don't, I, this was a poor example because I don't have a GitHub uh, dependency in there that would show it, but it's the exact same syntax. It would be github.com slash thing slash thing at version whatever the tag is. And underneath what that looks at is it will look for a tag with that exact version number. Um, if it can't find a tag, there's also a syntax to get the latest development head of a branch or to get master. Um, and these are all documented in the Go documentation. Um, so rather than trying to iterate through the various possibilities, I would just recommend that, that uh, you go have a quick look at the Go mod documentation, and it's all pretty pretty simply laid out. Any more questions? Doesn't look like it. Everybody.